Hello and welcome to the zeroth episode, I don't know, of my gaming tree. Hi, my name is Mark Sheriff. I'm a professor of computer science at University of Virginia, where among other things, I teach game design. And what I wanted to do with this video is, well, test my new setup to make sure all this works. Um, you know, new computer, who dis? Um, so a little bit about me. So I've been teaching computer science at UVA now for 13 years. And I've been teaching courses like intro to programming and mobile app development and software engineering, but also game design. And so one of the things I wanted to do is put together a video series talking about, well, basically the stuff in my game design course, because it'd be nice to have the material out there. And also it's fun to talk about. And well, I kind of miss making some of these videos. Uh, go check out the ones from my software engineering course for all over the past <laughs> the spring semester since we went virtual. But this is something I wanted to do this summer. So I thought I'd give it a shot. And also I wanted to test to make sure the new setup worked. So I'm not calling this the first official episode because I mean, I guess I just did. Well, whatever. But the idea is I need to make sure that all of this is working. So um, without further ado, what am I going to talk about in all these videos? Well, basically I'm going to do the content from my game design course. So if you're interested at all in game design or how we teach game, to get game design at, at UVA, this is a good option. So, the first lecture I always like to start with is, what is a game? Because this is a pretty easy question that many people think that they, they want to say the answer is to, well, of course I know what a game is. I, I, you know, I, I, I play all the Call of Duties. I play all of the, the, the Fortnites. I play all of the Monopolies. I, I know what a game is. Well, do you? What exactly is the definition of a game? So, you know, names and games. I named a couple right there. You know, thinking about just games that, you know, my family has played. My wife and I played an escape room game today, kind of, in, you know, a little box escape room called the Exit Series. It's pretty nice. Um, I was playing Animal Crossing earlier today. That's a lot of fun. Um, here on my desk in front of me, I've got my PlayStation 4. I've got some retro consoles. I got my little Genesis. Got my NES. Got my SNES. So tons of games on those. Um, Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, uh, Monster of the Week, all of those sorts of things. This right here, that's a game. Um, but is it limited to just that? Uh, you know, here's some thoughts. Chess, Monopoly, Hopscotch, yeah, okay. Poker, yeah. Now we start to get roulette. There's a lot of chance in roulette. Is it still a game or is it just gambling? Golf? Uh, I'm making kind of a, you know, the, the joke about golf sport versus, but yeah, is it a sport? Is it a game? Is it a sport? Is it both? Um, a flight simulator? Plenty of people play flight, flight simulators. Are they technically games or are they simulators? Dating? I usually get some snickers from the crowd at this point, at least in the class, because they think about previous dates they've had in the, uh, let's say the, 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 the creative ways that they have to, to, to impress their, uh, their partner. Um, tending a fire. Um, actually tending a fire. Is it a game? There's probably plenty of games out there where you do things like tend a fire. Heck, I was playing Animal Crossing earlier today where, you know, when my kindergartner is excited about visiting resident services and going to the art museum, you start asking about what exactly is a game. Playing a piano? Trading stocks? Are these games? Could they be games? Like, if you're a game designer, you might be thinking of some ways to make those into games. But are they actually games? So what makes a game a game? What is the aspect of an activity that makes us think, hey, this is a game? So here's a couple definitions, and I really love the first one here. Playing a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. Now think about that for a minute. It's the voluntary attempt. So one, you are making the conscious decision that you are going to take this on. You are going to, to overcome something. No one's making you do it. If they're making you do it. Is it really a game at that point? Or is it work? <laughs> um, and then unnecessary obstacles. You're forcing yourself to do things that you wouldn't normally have to do. Uh, another definition, a game is a system in which players engage in artificial conflict defined by rules that result in a quantifiable outcome. That's a very business-like definition right there, but you can kind of see that there is some sort of um, posing forces. There's rules that are, that are defining how you interact, 
and then there's an outcome. So coming back to which of these are games, let's actually take golf. Um, uh, Robin Williams has a fantastic stand-up routine um, in which he talks about golf. And the core of it is, um, what's the easiest way to get the golf ball into the hole? Well, one, you just walk up to the hole and drop it in. Or you get in a cart and you drive up there and you put, put the ball in. No, we're going to say you have to stay 400 yards away, okay? So can I just throw the ball? No, here's a stick with a little tiny head. Hit it. Okay, well, it's going to be a nice straight shot. No, there's going to be sand and water and it's going to turn. And there's trees in the way. Golf is kind of the definition of unnecessary obstacles. How about basketball? You know, the goal is 10 feet. I don't know about you. I'm of shorter stature. That's quite an unnecessary obstacle for me to get the ball into the hoop. Dribbling? Depending on which team you're a fan of, you could have a debate as to how much dribbling, how much extra carry the ball actually uh, happens. Um, but that is an unnecessary obstacle. The fact that you have to stay within the lines, the fact that you're not allowed to physically push over another player. These are all rules and, and obstacles that are put in the way that force you to accomplish a task in a particular way and you make the choice to take over that. So when you look at this list over here, you can kind of see, okay, some of these do fit in that definition. Another broad definition is every game has goals, rules, feedback, and voluntary participation. Okay? Goals, rules, feedback and voluntary participation. Notice that things that are not on this list include have fun. I have played a lot of games in which I have not had any fun. Um, games meant to scare me, I don't tend to have a ton of fun with because I play, me personally, I play games to escape um, for happier reasons, not because I want to feel bad. So, uh, but that, that is fun for some people. But fun, by definition, is not what makes a game a game. Okay, a goal. Now, in, in every game, there needs to be something you are trying to, to accomplish. Now, we're going to have an entire conversation about intrinsic goals versus goals defined by the game, um, because you could make an argument that games like Animal Crossing have a lot of goals in which um, the player defines the goals, as in, um, I want to make sure that I have a nice path between all of my residents' homes or things like that. But on a very simplistic term, if you look at something like Super Mario Brothers, just getting from the end of, you know, beginning to the end of the level within a certain number of chances to grab the flagpole is a goal, a very specific goal. Then you do that four times across eight worlds to then complete the game. Now you have ways of changing that goal, right? You can find warp areas, so therefore you don't have to do it quite as many times. Um, and then there are sub goals. A sub goal of every Super Mario game, I think every Super Mario game, is to collect 100 coins at various points because when you collect those coins, it has a benefit that then leads you to better be able to accomplish your goal. So these goals um, are layered on top of each other, providing you with tangible things you should be working for, both the overarching goals of the game and also sub goals that could be achievements or, or things that aid you to complete the major goal. So think about games that you've played. What are the goals you're trying to accomplish? Then there are rules. These are what provide the context for those unnecessary obstacles. Again, let's look at Super Mario Brothers. Um, the height of Mario's jump is a rule. The way you hold down the button to get different levels of height defines the way that your player character is going to be able to, trans to, to move from one part of the level to the other the rules of interacting with bad guys. So a Goomba, when you land on top of a Goomba, when those two sprites collide, a positive feedback occurs in that that you stomp the Goomba and you get 100 points and you move on about your life. But if there's a side contact between the two sprites, then Mario becomes small Mario or dies and then you have to, to keep going. These are the rules that define the obstacles. So um, the, the rules are there to, to limit player behavior so that you can't just like press up and make Mario fly to the top of the screen and move all the way to the end and then finish. Now, obviously in some, let's take Mario Brothers 3, there's the P-Wing where that's the idea. As you hit the A button as much as you can, you fly infinite amount of times. Well, that sort of rule breaking 
adds another layer of fun to the way the game works. So these rules force you to work within a structure, kind of like a puzzle, so that you can accomplish the goal in an interesting way. Feedback is incredibly important. And one of the things that really defines the difference between a game and work. So feedback means you get constant updates as to how you are progressing towards your goal throughout your experience. So every time you hit um, the end of a level in Super Mario Brothers and the flagpole goes down, feedback, you feel good. In Hearthstone, when you win a game, it's, it's big. You, you know, the, the, the opposing player explodes on the screen and stars and trumpets happen. You get feedback that you are making progress towards your goals. Um, feedback also occurs in small ways that encourage certain behaviors um, that encourage you to, do, to enact the rules in particular ways. Whenever you collect a coin, there is something just human need to hear that ding when you pick up a coin or that, that sound when you pick up a one-up mushroom or something like that. That sort of feedback drives you to continue to exercise those rules in a particular way and really get you moving toward your, toward your goal. You know, one of the things that people complain a lot about when they have a task is the amount of time that you spend on a task, but you, you don't know what's happening. So this is one reason why some people have trouble with exercise because they might not get an immediate feedback as to how they're, as to how they're, they are actually, um, excuse me, as I reconnect this controller, because that's going to use that later. Um, they don't get immediate feedback as to how they're doing with their exercise. So they, they get, they get frustrated. But now think about those apps out there that let you gamify exercise. You put in all of your exercises, you get little badges. You're turning exercise into a game. We're going to have a whole thing about talking about gamification and how this works and even going to look at how we do it in 3240 um, in my software engineering class and how we gamify the course there. But that sort of feedback is really, really important. And then there's the idea of volunteer, voluntary participation. Not only is this you agree to be a part of this game uh, and you agree to abide by the rules, but you 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 suspend disbelief. You, you, you say that, yes, I understand that. Um, in basketball, I could theoretically just walk down the court holding the ball and ignore the referee and just throw the ball at someone and whatever. And, and I might get escorted off the court or something like that, but I could do that, but then everyone would be mad at me with good reason, right? Because I have now broken the social contract of working within the game. If you're playing Monopoly and you just reach over and take some money out of the, 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 the banker, well, the till, not the banker. That'd be me. Just like rip it from their person or something. But if you just do that during the game, they're like, oh, you're cheating. You're not, you're, you're breaking that social contract. And when you do that, now no one's having fun. I know fun doesn't have to be part of a game. I already made that argument, but you, you see my point, right? So rules, goals, rules, feedback, and voluntary participation, all really important. So why do we play games? Why do we take on these unnecessary objectives rather than um, real world things? Well, if you, I mean, look at people who play World of Warcraft. I played a lot of World of Warcraft, okay? I, my slash played is pretty, pretty huge. So what is it about taking on that that people latch on to? Sometimes it is the feedback. Sometimes it is the control that you now have over achieving goals in a more um, manageable sort of way. Sometimes it is the social contract of agreeing to be a part of a different world. And that idea makes you excited. But for a lot of reasons, people want to play games because the, those rules, that feedback, those goals speak to them more than sometimes what just real, quote unquote, real life is like. And so when we can bring the two together, a lot of good things happen. The opposite of play isn't work. It's depression, is what quote here from Brian Sutton Smith. The idea that um, not participating 
in these sort of activities in a, on a human level um, means that you're not engaging in a way that's going to fulfill yourself. So what games give us are these concrete goals. We can use our skills in interesting ways, sometimes that we cannot use in, other, in, in, really, in real life sometimes, um, and gives us an, a feeling of success, sometimes in short chunks, that so you get a constant feedback loop, sometimes in larger chunks when you do something huge like build your island and Animal Crossing or some amazing Minecraft sculpture. Um, but sometimes it's just finishing a level. Sometimes it's just winning that one more game of Hearthstone. And then you can get fully invested in it. So th this, 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 this idea of find a job where, you, where you're doing something you love, you'll never work another day in your life. Well, it, it comes to the idea of buying into those systems. You know, if we choose to do something that gives us re regular feedback and challenges us um, in a career level, the same way that games do, then we can exercise all those same ideas of, of tangible goals, um, of interesting rules, constant feedback, and it gives us that help. So there's all different types of work that you can do, both game work and work work, that fulfills it. So high stakes work. Um, is there a possibility of failure? So you could, this could be something like a big presentation. You know, some people really get excited about that because, you know, I'm going to make a big sale or something like that. But also um, we're going into a raid boss and there's a possibility of failure. You know, there is that adrenaline rush, um, busy work. Um, you know, sometimes you get in a rhythm of, of feeling good about doing uh, gardening, for instance. Um, where it's a constant repetitive motion and you're, you're kind of getting in a groove and you, you, you get into it. Same thing with Tetris. Um, same thing with Candy Crush. Same thing with um, pick any match three game. You get into a mental rhythm and that idea, those, that, that sort of feedback speaks to you. So uh, mental work. Um, sometimes working through a tough algorithm, sometimes working through a tough uh, machine learning algorithm to, to calculate some data feels very satisfying. Building, um, uh, solving a, um, all these are computer science references. Gee, I wonder why. Um, so something like that, but also maybe I do an escape room, um, either in a video game or in real life. So yeah, games are a lot of things. Games are a lot of things. And I want to actually share with you a little bit of a game right now as we talk about some of this. And I want to talk about Ninja Gaiden. So game for the, for the NES, um, a fantastic, fantastic action game, which many of you, if you're on the younger side, probably have not played, but has a lot of really interesting things to talk about. And um, let me turn that down just a smidgen so you can still hear me. Maybe somewhere in that level. So what I want you to see here is I have a goal. And right now my goal is to get to the end of this level without my character dying. And there are rules. So the way that I jump here, grab it, there it goes. The sprite of my sword when I swing it. Uh, when it makes contact with an enemy sprite that is going to defeat the enemy when i hit one of these lamps it will provide me with an item this should be the flame yep you have special weapons by hitting up and up and b or in my case x because i'm using a special controller so the the goal of this game from a just you know mechanical perspective that gummit is is to get to the end of in the, each of the levels without, without dying from a narrative perspective my character here ryu um, is trying to stop a demon from re-entering the world and i have specific rules in the game like this particular enemy boss is not especially difficult um but it governed how my character is able to move how my character is able to jump and then we get feedback. Ooh, they seem to be following me. For those of you who don't know, Ninja Gaiden is actually one of the first instances of cinematic scenes in an NES game. Um, there are certainly plenty of other examples of this, but to put this sort of 
goal um, to reveal more of the story to progress the narrative aspect in an action game was actually pretty novel at the time when Ninja Gaiden was first released in 1989. Um, and so we are moving through acts. Well, there's more story. I forgot about this part. More now we're in prison. Kind of prison. Eh, you'll have to see it to see how it works. Yeah, actually. Okay, I'm going to stop that for a moment. So, these are the aspects of it. Now, what I would like to do over the next few videos is to talk about some of the emotional reasons that we want to play games. Specifically, we're going to talk about mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. And with each of those, I would like, with each of the different aesthetics, play a different game, show you how it works. So, thanks for joining me for this very quick intro video. I just wanted to put one out there, see how this worked. There's no editing to this yet. You, can, you saw some of my graphics of the little gaming tree, which I really like. Um, but I need to actually make title cards and audio and transitions. But I'm going to put this up and, I don't know, see if people like it and kind of go from there. So, I hope you're doing well. Uh, I hope you are playing some games right now. I hope you're enjoying yourself. So, with that said, I'll see you the next time sitting underneath my gaming tree. Bye!